Good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Bryant Francis. Uh, I guess when I say wherever in the world, it could be good morning, it could be good evening, whatever. Um, we are here today playing an interesting game that I stumbled on at PAX West called Air Memories of Old. Um, it's a very pretty game, as you can see here. Um, you might be looking at those islands far off in the distance and wondering, wow, how is he going to get there? I'll explain that in a second. Um, down in the lower left-hand corner, I have two wonderful faces with me. Alex, first of the faces, <laughs> who are you? Why are you here? Hey, uh, somehow I'm still Alex Waro, an editor at Kamasutra.com, uh, and I'm just here to sort of be your wingman as you're we fly through. <laughs> you're my wingman? Is that yeah. are you implying that I might be doing some flying in a minute? Uh, oh yeah, no. I mean, just just in case you just do in case, any. Yeah, any... Robin. Uh, um, could you please introduce yourself, uh, your game, and why you're here? Yeah. So uh, my name is Robin. Thank you for having me. Uh, the game is Air Memories of Old, and uh, I am uh, one of the developers, uh, the game designer and game director, to be uh, like. Um, yeah. To say what it actually is. So uh, yeah, from the from the developer Forgotten Key, uh, back in Sweden. So. Hi everyone. And what is air? <laughs> what what should they everyone be looking out for? Is uh, yes. I wonder about this tree here. Yeah. So uh, air memories of old is the game that we can see on the screen right now. Uh, it was released um, just a few weeks ago, and it's a like atmospheric exploration adventure in which you have the ability to uh, to fly. Maybe. Wait, you can fly? <laughs> maybe. Let's find out. Ah, uh, maybe. Jump off yeah. And fall yeah. Into the abyss. Nice. Yeah, so you can fall, and yeah! uh, you can also transform into a bird. Yeah, I'm a bird! Nice. I'm a freaking bird trying to... Oh, God. That, the camera uh, camera controls are a little sensitive on console. Stay on yeah, target. Yeah. Stay on target. You can switch to the... Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, there we go. Yep. Woohoo! I just want to... The only reason I'm being so <laughs> boisterous and playful everyone nice. is that... I found this game of PAX uh, while I was wandering around on one of the upper levels, uh, and I was really struck by the flying mechanic that Robin and his team put together. Um, if you're a reader of Gamasutra.com and enjoy our deep dives that we do, uh, Robin and I are working to get a little deep dive of the flying system together. Um, but just yes. to get things started, Robin, you gave me a pitch at, uh, at PAX saying that apparently yeah. this took quite some time to put together. Could you explain that? Yeah, so um exactly. So um we have um we have developed the game since uh, quite early in 2013. Uh it started out as a bachelor thesis project with some um uh, like a few different groups writing a uh, thesis each and we try to combine those um, ideas and theories that we have into a concrete game concept and we build the first prototype during that period. Of course we were writing as well so it's kind of us half time that time and uh, since then we've been working on the game so you could say it's like four or five years development to to get where we are, where the game is now where it's to, to release um, and um, I would say that maybe two of those years went into building the the flying mechanic for the game, or to to get it quite right. So yeah, exactly. I'm just, uh, I should be look progressing. I, I just opened the door of the temple, but I just love flying in this game so much that all I want to do yeah. is just soar. <laughs> nice. Well, I, I I think I mean let's let's start there, right? Like I think yeah. that is what's interesting about this game is not that there is a progression system or a story, although I'm sure there's something there to be uncovered. But what's so yeah. interesting is this appears to be a game designed um, to just. Uh, give players a fun atmospheric sensation like just just boot it up fly around this world and just take it easy and honestly i'd be happy just spending an hour watching bryant do this uh, <laughs> it's super relaxing um nice. i i would guess that's intentional but maybe we can unpick um why like what is it about this style and philosophy of game design that appeals to you and your team yeah so um we can start with like uh, the ideas we had when we wrote our uh, thesis, uh, like uh, the the actual texts, like what the ideas we had there, um, that later on became became this uh, became this game. Um, so there were two two main theses like that were written. Uh, one was um, uh, about that I was part of. We were writing about how to build 
like aesthetically focused games, games that were built around one core experience uh, and tried to do that as much as possible. And uh, the other guys were writing about how to build game worlds inspired by um, cubism and minimalism. And that's kind of where it started out. Um, so the idea that, like, I, I, I was having the idea that if you can try to uh, uncover what uh, the feeling or experience or aesthetic of a game is like actually playing it and interacting with it um, trying to put it in words or put it in like some kind of uh, as some kind of target like what is the core experience we want to to convey with with the game then you can start designing with all the core uh, elements like the design of the game the mechanics the art of the game the game world the story etc uh, to kind of uh, ramp up to that experience. Um, so we had a few different uh, uh, ways of describing this goal already in the beginning, uh, which uh, like kept true to through the whole development, even though a lot of things changed around it. Um, one of the most important ones were uh, like having a game that was solely about exploring um, and uh, having a game that allowed uh, the player to feel really free while exploring. And of course, we felt like we needed to... I, we, we didn't want to do a walking simulator right out because it's uh, uh, we wanted the game to feel like an adventure and something that was fun while you explored. And uh, that's how we uh, started working on the on the flying mechanic to kind of have that as the, the core that, that drove the exploration feeling of the game. Yeah, I... Um... Uh, I wonder maybe we could dig a bit into that as well. Like when you're yeah. when you're trying to design something, you might you might call a flap them up for lack of a better term. Like the idea of a yeah. game that is purely about just flying and soaring. Like uh, yeah. what what feels good about that and what feels bad about that um, to you? Um, I think we had a really hard time f understanding what was really fun about the game. We knew that the flying was fun in itself like really early and i mean it's uh, if you if you just look at the flying mechanic we didn't start out with uh, turning into a bird or anything we started out with uh, uh, a little girl with a hang glider who couldn't uh, flap her wings or gain speed anyway but just gain height by flying into uh different uh, like upward streams uh, warm air uh, and um it was quite funny fun in itself to fly around but it it didn't really give you that freedom because we were locked into the level design. Uh, we, we moved on to kind of, and we asked ourselves, why do we, why do we f like traverse this magical world in such a mundane way? And then we um, came up with a story about uh, the birds and everything, and just came up with the idea like, why, why didn't we just tap into the fantasy of <laughs> turning into a bird? It feels very natural for a flying game. Um, and uh, we tried out some different ideas with uh, having some kind of uh, uh, stamina system or whatever. But the more we tried out what was fun about the game and the more we got feedback from uh, from people in our vicinity that played it, um, we just realized that the, the sensation of just jumping out and just transforming and just flying around was um, what was most fun. Uh, yeah. And we, we had been a bit um, hesitant to go that way because it felt like um, uh, a big challenge and it turned out to be a big challenge. Um, I would say that some of the main reasons for this is if you just have a place to fly around, that kind of works for a while, but it can also uh, bore you after a little while. Uh, mm -hmm. We wanted to build something that felt like an adventure where you were um, doing something and where we had other parts that we wanted to come together to create this whole experience that we created. But uh, um, like stuff such as challenges becomes almost redundant as you have a, a totally overpowered uh, mechanic that can can let the player do pretty much whatever they want to. Um, like level design, for example, is a very very difficult yeah uh, task. It, for us. It, it's, it seems like you know hearing you walk through that process. Like uh, yeah. I think instinctively, anybody that plays games or thinks about game design, um, like there is a there is a feeling that you have to put some kind of friction in a game so that yeah. players have something to push against and they have something exactly. to achieve right uh, yeah. and that if they don't it might be boring or something um, but it makes a lot of sense that like uh, that you know like it's way more fun to just be a bird and fly around a beautiful yeah. world than it is to like yeah. worry about catching up drafts <laughs> so um, like how did you how did you try to find a way to give uh, uh, how did you give players something 
to engage with if they felt like it without sort of uh, hampering their ability to just fly around and explore. Yeah, so we had um, we had two um, two realizations uh, in some point of development that were pretty important to us. And and remember that we were like we were university students, so we weren't professional. We didn't have any like um, other experience. So this was all new to us in in all terms of development. But we had two realizations during the design uh, period, which um, one of them was um, um, to try instead of uh, challenging the player to try to invite them to play around with the game world, to make it a playground. So we put out a lot of, um, uh, of stuff such as those kind of holes in the islands you can fly through, the, the wind streams that give you a bit of speed boost. We tried to every island cluster to make them a bit different and to kind of design a, a very, uh, almost a hidden kind of path that we wanted the player to fly through. So I think that uh, what goes on in the head of the player is pretty much that you you fly towards an island because you think you want to do that and uh, because you want to look a bit cool. And then you are like avoiding avoiding the island, flying a bit cool, um, and then you're met with um, like a split-second decision of do I want to go to that next point of interest or that next point of interest? And it's kind of subtle in a lot of, uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and that was really difficult to, to come up with how how to do that and uh, i'm not sure that we uh, like made it uh, in every island cluster but we have seen players like flying the the path that we wanted them to when we have tried out the game mm -hmm. um I, probably without them really noticing <laughs> themselves so that was uh, that was quite uh, quite fun to see um, yeah uh, what was the process of like ironing that out i imagine there was a good bit of play testing done did you do it mostly with friends, or did you contract with anybody, or was it sort of all at events like uh, packs? I know. Yeah, I, I mostly with uh, with friends in the beginning, like other game companies here in uh, Kalsam, and with uh, we we also have um, uh, a campus uh, with the game education, like right next door to our studio. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had uh, students coming over and and play testing the game. Uh, but also a lot of it was uh, like in house within the studio. Even if we were a small team, we were still a diverse cast of <laughs> different disciplines so we could someone could build something and then try out on the other developers one by one and then you get quite much data without uh, organizing the events yeah. uh, of getting people in. yeah i have a question are some of these clouds animals because this one below me seems like a whale and this one seems like an octopus like <laughs> uh, now 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 they are maybe <laughs> yeah i love this i don't um... think that's <laughs> oh well okay well but yeah. i guess that's see seeing things in clouds is how you're supposed to do it i love yeah. this um i'm flying back and forth over this because i love i love the shape uh the shapes that are yeah. created by your flight movement and the way that like clouds and islands create like like this consistent use of uh foreground mid ground and back and the far background to like create these frames that you're flying through with such mid yeah. like, and there's no and there's only the compass above you just for navigation um mm -hmm. It's a very nice effect that I think uh, is p helps make this game striking. It's it's one thing to just like I think it's one thing to just use an art style like Journey, but I think there's some excellent uh, like use of speed and placement here to have the player mm. see interesting things. Brian, do you want to just sit here and maybe cloud gaze for a minute? Like I feel like the one you're flying through kind of looks like Max Headroom flexing, except his arm is an what? octopus tentacle. Where did you get Max Headroom from? <laughs> just the way his, the way his head is shaped. You see the head there, like. Right See? here, right here. No, well, no, yeah, that. Well, that's that? that's a weird angle. But oh, yeah. that, from okay. that angle, it looks more like a again. weird whale. See, that looks like a whale right there. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Maybe the Titanic. I don't know. Here, let me spin around again so I can find your max headroom. That looks kind of like a chip or a banana, <laughs> like a giant banana. You think? Okay, so this looks like max. Oh, I see it now. That's the banana. Yes. Oh yeah, no, yeah. Sorry, I'm behind on the stream. Yeah. No, watch, so there's max headroom sky, flexing with his tentacle. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I see I, where you're coming from now. Okay, that diversion over. Uh, <laughs> uh, Robin, I'm going to divert to what, yes. why I stopped on this uh, this little bird's nest here. Um, there are little um, the game's narrative design uh, spurses. It's it does feel a bit walking simulator ish. Like it feels inspired yep. by um, either. Uh, uh, excuse uh, me, stroll playing game. Thank you. <laughs> I'm done. I'm leaving. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it feels inspired by either a little bit Gone Home, a little bit um, uh, Alex, help me out. What's that one European 
game company uh, who oh um uh the rapture everyone's gone to the rapture yeah everyone's in <clears> the <throat> chinese room Ch- chinese yeah just feel chinese room um yeah like there's like like little bits of there's lots lots of like kind of diorama ish bits scattered throughout the world. There's some characters you can talk to, like you know we met the fox back there. Um, but if I were to go back to the starting area, there's actually like a little village that has a ruined city on it. How did you like? I guess what was your philosophy for making interesting things for players to find on these islands, and how did you make sure that like either how did you find the balance between like it's okay if they find them, um, or you want them to find them, it's okay if they don't. Uh, some islands are interesting, some islands are boring. Like, how did you create this mix of stuff that would give the player useful character information? Yeah, so um, uh, one other of the core ideas of, uh, of the development was to let the player discover as much as possible for themselves, like both about how the game works and, uh, uh, and about the story of the game. So, for example, here you have some environmental oh, good, good. stuff. Oh, that looks kind of sad. Uh, yes. Aww. It's more depressing than I expected. Okay, moving on. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, we we did work quite much with the uh, story for the game for a very long time, uh, and um, uh, we tried to to make sure that uh, to to encourage exploration and make exploration fun in itself. We want we first of all we didn't want to hold the player's hand. We wanted them to go to uh, every place they could in the game from like right after the the tutorial and um we also wanted them to be able to complete the game in different orders to to kind of make it uh, feel like um like to to give the player a choice of how they wanted to experience it and make the players feel smart by finding different places and kind of puzzle things together um so instead of uh, like progression in terms of um uh getting better at flying or getting new mechanics we um moved most of that into um, like progression through understanding of both the game world and uh, the game story, uh, like about what has happened in the world, what's happening now, and what are you supposed to do in it, uh, and also about like the game rules. So, for example, uh, you you do have the lantern that you can pick up, and um, you are only explained to how to pick up the lantern. But uh, in the same part of the tutorial, we also show you like the uh, some um, some glowing shapes in the air that you can uh, like shine lights upon, which will do, like um, shed light on the ghostly figures uh, that are memories from the old painting out different scenes. So that, together with this kind of uh, scrolls, um, build up a story. So, uh, um, like for the lantern, for example, we have these ghosts uh, by the activation uh, platforms where you started with the puzzle where you got your uh, key in the cave um, uh, earlier on in the stream uh, and um, we don't explain how that mechanic works we let the player go there and experiment with it um, and that kind of builds a string of discoveries and we try to do the same with these kind of scrolls and uh, ghost scenes so that some ghost scenes point to other ghost scenes some scrolls are connected with other scrolls in the world um, and uh, we don't explain how it works for the player, but let them discover how it works and um, try to build up like this system of different discoveries that all together um, makes the understanding of the game world and uh, and the, the game mechanics a little bit stronger for each time for the player. Um, and that's the thing that took us a long time to understand how to do in a good way for the player to... Um, enjoy it like when we had all this information and when we had an idea for what we wanted to um to tell like this the the lore of the the world the the story that the game was and all of that we could quite easily break it up into two parts basically like one which was um gameplay crucial information like uh, guiding for the player basically mm-hmm. um and um like to all these backstory lore things and then we could just make sure that we put the most important information in unskippable places, which is very few places in the game. Um, and then uh, put the rest of the information just spread out so that it had like some kind of coherency. So we have different storylines in different parts of the world, etc. Um, but I mean, it's uh, we tried to spread it out as much as we could, but we also tried to connect it to the different parts of the world. And, and uh, it was uh, quite a lot of work behind behind finding a, a good balance between those those uh, things. 
Yeah, no joke. Uh, I should real real quick. I'll, I'll duck into chat here and grab a question from the Pink Frog, who just wants to ask real quick: Does the game have any kind of day or night cycle? Any changing weather or any other influence to the way the world looks? Uh, yeah, so we don't have any uh, day night cycle. We don't have any weather changes depending on uh, time. Mm-hmm. But we do have. Um, we built we built the world the way that if you fly around the sky's color will change depending on your location in the world and uh, also uh, there is a snowy area there is a more rocky more bluish cold uh, color area and it is this area with more warm colors and there's also a night sky area like winter night uh, area so it kind of transitions very smoothly as you fly around the world rather than being dependent on time as in other games Nice, yeah. You got it. You got it all. You got a. You got a water level. You got a lava level. Sounds like you got a <laughs> level. It's perfect. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I, I'm gonna real quick uh, jump into. First, I'm gonna figure out where I want to go. I've just been sort of coasting yeah. around. Um, oh, let's go northwest. Um, mm. uh, whoops. Um, I have a nasty habit of hitting X when I mean to square with this game. Um, I'm going to um, point out something. So I'm gonna take a. Let me climb for a second here, and then take a dive. So when you jump off of things, your character is just really nice. There's like these nice little polished details into anim- into the animations. Like you do have the swan dive that she does when she jumps off something. Um, you have these little like other like she does this. Little, if you idle, she does this little skip hop thing. What are uh, do these animations like help players feel good flying at all? Like how did you uh, come to create these little details and sort of the the flying system? Um. So the animations and everything. Um. Mm-hmm. So um, I guess that's also connected to another very complex problem we had, which is if you can fly, it means you can stand on uh, everything and you can collide with everything in any direction. And uh, uh, you have to have a few different modes of falling through the air because if you jump like once, you will only be upright. That would be the most logical thing. Yeah. But if you, if you uh, turn out of bird and you kind of just... I mean, a jumping position is, can look a little bit weird if you fly that way forward through the air. Um, so uh, we we tried to design those different kind of cases for what we wanted. So we have like a, a, an ordinary fall state for the player, and then we have a free fall state where you have a bit more uh, control, and you have like the character leaning forward and um, all that kind of stuff. And then we have a free fall landing, which is more smooth with magic, trying to explain why the character doesn't uh, get hurt by falling down to the ground. And we have... Uh, um, that kind of stuff, but I think that um, like not only like um, the animations for themselves, they try to tell something about the character. And one of the core uh, core ideas about our main character is that she should be um, she she should be light. So um, <laughs> we don't have we don't have that many uh, like personality traits for her because she is. Um, she is a silent character, and she's supposed to kind of like Link, be someone that the player can um, project themselves to onto quite much. Uh, so we didn't want her to give we didn't want to give her too much of a personality, other than that she's like a, someone who who is capable, who is uh, who has all these capabilities of doing the things she is um, uh, tasked with. Yeah. Um, that put a lot more um, importance on the, like, the physical characteristics of the character to make sure that the character designs stand, stand out in a good way. Uh, so we tried to find a few of these um, ideas, and one of them, one the core one, was uh, to have a light character, which is also why the, kind of the, the running animation is a bit floaty, and she takes very long strides and just tapping the ground very lightly before she runs further. Um, uh, so it's a conscious choice with someone. Some people have been a bit turned off <laughs> about because they feel like the, the, the character is missing a bit of, um, uh, you know, weight to them. Um, but yeah. it's also like uh, transferred into the flying that trying to, um, trying to to build on that throughout throughout this that kind of mechanic. Uh, just on the list of things that I love about this game, uh, this is really haunting. Like the, the 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 ghost people, these ghostly images you find that don't just have like silhouettes, but uh, if you look closely, this sort of like skeleton in there. And sort of following, mm. like, like you get this. It's very, it is both grim and beautiful. Like, like just looking at these inherently in their in their poses uh, is an easy way to like feel like a little bit sad. Like, like those animals we saw earlier uh, that were dead mm. on the ground. These are some of those things that I think had a nice job of uh, 
they add some simple meaning just by finding them. Yeah, I um, you mentioned Zelda a minute ago, and this game gives yeah. me some strong uh, Breath of the Wild vibes. Um, I'm sure not not intentionally because this game has been in development for years, but like yeah. there's a silent protagonist, there's like a, a bright and colorful world that is studded with little um, like bits and pieces of a broken past. Uh, and you know, especially I like the, the map screen, especially reminds me of like old Zelda games. Um, so I sort of wonder that just you know, while you're working on this, what um, what did you look to for inspiration and influence, whether in games or in art or film or anything else? Yeah. So uh, as I said, like um, uh, we were starting with uh, bachelor thesis projects, and uh, one of yeah. the groups, the one with minimalism and cubism, they were uh, the starting artists of the game, basically, and they. <laughs> Uh, kind of built the the art style um, for it. Um, one of the guys is uh, one of the co-founders of the studio who is still with us uh, in the in the studio, and uh, the other one um, decided to after school to uh, to move on to other things, and he now works at uh, Dice. So that's why I said starting artists. Um, but uh, like, there is a blog called A Year or a Day. I'm not sure if it's on still, but uh, we did like a lot of low poly stuff in the very beginning, which was kind of colorful and. We wanted to make. We did. We did know that the studio we wanted to make was something with uh, atmospheric adventures and kind of quirky stuff and kind of um, like doing something different. So we we looked at that and we thought like this is a really cool like uh, foundation to start working from. Um, and then we looked at like uh, classical art in minimalism, in, in cubism. Cubism. This is not cubism in in that kind of sense because that has much more to do with perspectives rather than uh, than forms in a lot of sense. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, like there were a lot of um, that kind of. Um, uh, reducing forms but still have them uh, relatable in the right context uh, that that stuck through mm-hmm. um, we also knew that we wanted to make a game that had um, like feeling wise was somewhere in between um, uh, the Legend of Zelda Wind Waker um, mm-hmm. and uh, Journey uh, so both of them were also uh, big influences both on uh, like world design uh, story design and also art and uh, like game design how that worked Mm. I wonder if we could dig a bit into uh, the actual like bits and pieces of how you made it. Like, first of all, I, I you know I, I should probably be able to know this, but um, what engine did you use to build this on? Uh, we it's Unity. It's Unity. Mm. We worked. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, you know, you, you may not be willing to talk about this, depending on your feelings about like um, fundraising and stuff. But you guys have been working on this yeah. for years. I'd, I'd love yeah. to know how you managed to stay fed while you were. Um, um, putting this together like did you do did you did you self-finance did you get funding from some kind of uh, agency did you do contract work like how did this how did this work for you as a studio and a team yeah uh no it's uh, no problem i'm totally open about these kind of things because it's uh, probably one of the things that's the most important <laughs> like uh, interesting to other people yeah. as well especially uh game uh, developers are trying to start up their own studios um so actually when we started the studio uh like way back in 2011 we did it with uh, some money that we won in a game competition nice. uh, so there's a game competition in in Carlson called uh, the the town we're located in called game concept challenge which gives out cash prize for game concepts uh, especially to students of the campus we're at so we we won that like total by surprise during our first years of study um so we got enough money to start up the company, and we ended up winning the same competition three years in a row. Um, but was with, it the same concept or different concepts? No, different concept every <laughs> year. So uh, <laughs> the first the first game was a small point-and-click adventure, which was released. The other game was also a point-and-click adventure in a totally different vibe, which we uh, never worked further on after a while because it didn't it wasn't feasible. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the third year was with the air, and then we thought we should probably stop participating in this competition <laughs> to not you know take all their funds uh but that was kind of what kept us going in the very beginning uh together with some personal savings of the founders of the studio uh which was very little to be honest so <laughs> we kind of survived for i don't know uh four to six months after graduating uh when our student loan weren't you know covering the expenses anymore yeah. um and then uh, i had like two cents on my savings account <laughs> and that's <laughs> that was kind of uh, stressful um but yeah. we did we did talk to a we had a we have a local um, like investment fund in in Kalsam that is like trying to um, you know stimulate local growth 
local economic growth and they are super interested in especially like uh, digital media and games because that's kind of a focus for for the municipality that we're that we live in so they have invested a lot of money into that kind of um, uh, industries uh, like through for example this uh, cash price from the from the award but also like in terms of venture capital so we we got a smaller venture co- venture capital investment that wouldn't last long in any meanings of the word but it gave us like a runway of i don't know six months or so mm-hmm. um during that time we also secured uh, publisher funding um i can't disclose from who at that point but sure. we had a we had a like collaboration for uh, a more proper pre-production of the game where we uh, we built a demo and uh, after that we went separate ways and we sorted out so that we uh, have the rights to the game to continue developing it um after that, we were in the same kind of situation. We had grown like a few people, so we were six people in total then, um, and uh, we were like seeing, you know, uh, how many months we had still until the money would just run out and we would have to do something else. Yeah. Um, so we prepared a, a full Kickstarter campaign with all the presentation materials required for it, um, and it was only to press the go button to to kind of start it. Um, but before we before we did so, we went to Gamescom uh, in uh, in Germany to to pitch to other uh, other publishers, and that's when we uh, ended up in a publisher deal with Daedalic um, uh, Entertainment, who uh, who funded uh, a large part of the of the game's development. Since then, we've also taken in a bit more money in uh, in venture capital investment to to secure, you know. Uh, like having a future, doing, growing the team a little bit, making sure everything is of quality, etc. So, that's uh, uh, it's a combination of different uh, solutions to to gain money. Yeah, that's <laughs> to, quite to be a able to, yeah. that's quite a journey <laughs> from out of school to uh, your second publisher, basically, uh, and yep. having to make all those pitches and stuff. I, um, yep. it's it's good to share that stuff. I think I think you're absolutely right. Yep. Um, the you know in the run up to launch, I mean, um, the, I confess that when Bryant mentioned this game, I yeah. never heard of it because there yeah. are just just a lot of games coming out. So I, I'd yeah. be curious to know how you guys went about um, getting uh, attention for this game and trying to get it in front of the people you thought would enjoy it the most. Yeah, uh, so I think this is probably like the most difficult thing in game development right now. Yep, <laughs> <laughs> because. Uh, there are so many people in doing so many really high quality games, like everything from uh, you know uh, just recreation things where you shoot and relax, uh, to stressful, to horrifying, to uh, relaxing, etc. So there's really there's almost no kind of niche left where you can just do an excellent game and that will be picked up and and do great uh, success by itself. Um, so I think like the main thing we we tried to do was trying to identify who who would really like this game like who are who are like us <laughs> <laughs> and then try to find them and try to reach out to them in a good way um, but yeah um, it was definitely uh, very difficult. We tried out uh, an Imgur post at launch day, but mm-hmm. I mean uh, that launch day is way too late to do uh, to marketing so we started like uh, a long time earlier uh, to to do to, to reach out, and I think maybe for this game we started a bit too early. Actually, already in 2013, oh. we released uh, a trailer. Like we did, we did a you know, we did the the demo of the game during our bachelor thesis project, and then after that we looked at this demo and we said, "Is this really what we want the game to be? Probably not." So we um, we came up with a lot of new ideas, and um, we. Uh, changed like the concept and we made a trailer of the game we wanted to make uh, rather than making the game first and that took us a lot less time than ma- building a game obviously mm. um this was part of the pitching process as well but we posted this video online like as a work in progress concept uh, trailer um f- which is pretty much a trailer for a game that doesn't exist um and it was yep. picked up by like Kotaku and Polygon no not Polygon Kotaku and Rock Paper Shotgun and Destructoid etc so um we started there and we tried to like continue doing that kind of stuff for a long while and it kind of grew some kind of fan base from the beginning so that's kind of trying trying to keep that uh, going but as i said it was a bit early so keeping a momentum going for four or five years is a very difficult task yeah <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah i don't know it's um, it's difficult i would probably do it different if i started from the beginning today 
Well, you well, you read my mind. How how would you do it differently if you had a yeah. second chance? Uh, I would um, I would wait much longer before I uh, I announced anything about the game uh, because if I I think like getting people interested in something is um, is not really the the biggest problem. It's keeping people interested and uh, like making sure that they remember what they've seen, like mm. making them engage with the experience or like, you know, connect with people. And uh, I think like if you release something so many years beforehand, um, then it's very difficult to even remember that <laughs> like down the line. Um, yeah. And especially if you're working with, um, with press, a lot of press uh, usually feel like they have, like they want to have uh, uh, new value to 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 give out to the readers of of the magazines, and uh, that's not always uh, the case. If you um, have shown a lot of the game very early on, um, it was very kind of you to say magazines. That's uh, <laughs> that's like uh, there are still more than one video game magazine, especially yeah. uh, uh, outside the North America. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I think uh, in talking to indie devs, I think what's really come to light is not just um, how important it is to get people excited about your game and show them what's exciting about it, but yeah. to make sure that they are excited about buying it when it is available for sale. Um, yeah. And that's kind of like a black art, right? It's like figuring out how yeah. long in advance to start talking about your work. And yeah. it's been funny because like um, other devs have, have taken the opposite tack. I'm thinking of the folks behind Ooblets, yeah. which is yeah. still... You know, well in development, but they've been very public about like we're just going to sort of develop up front, and then whatever people are excited about seeing, we're going to focus on that first and yeah. foremost, and then we're going to work on it. Um, yeah. And I'll be curious to see how that turns out. Uh, that has yeah. nothing to do with this game, uh, no. but what is interesting about this game is, um, uh, you know, like uh, I- I'm surprised you didn't really mention um, YouTube at all or Twitch. Did you see any big pickup there? Did you did you work with those folks at all? Because that seems to be a big deal and. In indie game marketing these days, yeah, get word out, but um. yeah, yeah, I, I, we we have seen quite many, like uh, quite a few uh, good good YouTube videos and uh, quite a few uh, Twitch streamers. Uh, and I just wanted to to add to what I said before. Of, of course, mm-hmm. it's possible to um, to do that kind of thing where you post a lot for a long time, um, and uh, especially as uh, with Ooblets, for example, uh, it feels like they target uh, their community. Uh, yeah. Rather than uh, trying to get like uh, um, their initial awareness, their initial awareness is kind of uh, built up already by first gathering um, like their f- like starting community somehow and making them share the game, and then um, then talking to press after that when they already gathered some interest, and that kind of works because then then outlets know that um, there is an interest in, to mm. to to kind of push about it um, and I think that's a really smart thing to do as well uh, like build a community and try to uh, talk to them and I think the the bottom line of everything I'm saying I, I, I don't want to be cynical and like be, oh you have to do a specific marketing strategy etc right, yeah. I think the most important thing is just to be genuine and be open to your players uh, and and to the people out there in the industry and uh, and talk to them and listen to them uh, but I think like if you want to you know uh, if you want to to get a lot of attention later on in the development, then I think um, like saving like the biggest secrets or um, like the or not maybe the biggest secret, but like larger larger full blown assets to a bit later on um, than five years before. It's a it's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I, I think it's important to be agile too, right? I mean, yeah. you look at Ublitz and it seems like they struck on a community and then they capitalized on it. They reacted and now they target yeah. them very strongly but i mean you know working on air it sounds like you guys were all set and ready to go for crowdfunding but then you were able to react and like switch focus to work with a publisher instead because you had the opportunity um so i think that's like really key when you're when you when you have the freedom to be a small team that can um sort of like switch and move quickly like taking advantage of that is uh it's a really good idea exactly uh yeah yeah? sorry no please go ahead I had I had a really good discussion with um, uh, with some people for not that like not that long ago about uh, like the importance of having um, you know gathering uh, feedback from uh, from players uh, and reacting to that and building on that or um, on the other hand putting all the decisions in the hand of a creative uh, director or a game director and then just you know don't show anything or or at least not let anyone influence you and i think uh, both of them are um 
are like uh, good ways to go about it as long as you know the purpose about your method of uh, of proceeding with uh, with those kind of ideas because um if you have a really like strong artistic idea that you want to uh put out there um then it might be good to you know build something build a, a, a hypothesis hypothesis about like what players are going to how they're going to react at uh, at certain events and then go playtesting with those ideas in mind and see if if they work or not um and in other cases it might be like as for ublets for example that they they were it seems like they were building something they really thought was fun and cool and looked good and then they put it out there and people also thought it looked good and was really cool and they continue working on that but it can also uh, in for some people in some cases it might also skew the um the final experience built a little bit by yeah. like the wants of the of the players and uh, it depends on what what you want as a developer uh, what kind of methods works for you i think yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Um, I think there's like a lot to unpack there, and also there's like a lot, yeah. like a lot of it comes down to luck, you know. Like it, it yeah, like absolutely, absolutely. Like, so, you know, it's it's hard to really like make any meaningful suggestions or give advice when really a lot of it's just like, well, it's just you know, it, we happened yeah. to hit at the right time, we found the right people, and that was that. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. Brian, I mean, uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I I wouldn't um, if I give out advice at anything, I I would probably. <laughs> Given, give them out with a caution of not listening to them as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do what feels right based on the information you have. Yeah, totally. Uh, Brian, are you? Uh, what are you up to in here? I'm fascinated yeah. by this architecture. This are you like, trying to solve a puzzle? Really or? cool. Yeah, the puzzle is um, this is a sun and moon temple, and I activated the moon stuff. And it looks like over there is the switch I need to get, or activate the sun stuff, excuse me. And over there it looks like the switch I need to get to the moon stuff. And I'm just yeah. sort of, I'm sort of stumbling in the dark. This is not, um, uh, I, with all love and respect, Robin, this isn't like the most intuitive temple I've ever been through in a game, but I can't help but be, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm pretty well surprised at how pleasant it feels. Like other temples that I've had frustrated with in games, temple puzzles, have been unpleasant in the end. Um, I'm struck by, but I'm struck by how this one does a good job. Like once you're off the path, like it does a, it does a good job looping you back. It uses narrative, little narrative rewards. Like back there, mm. I fell into the chasm, found some ghosts with a, who were talking about hunting rats. Went up, came back up through. I'm pointing. No one can see me. Point. Um, over there, I'm where I'm looking right now. Um, I came back yep. up there and saw some people trapped under a pillar, and now I realize I loop back around and that this way is the way to go because the lighting is guiding me through this space. So mm. that's that's where I am right now. That's my sort of on-the-fly uh, playtesting feedback. Um, the only thing that nice. confused me about this moon puzzle is that the, the starting entrance to it was further back than the sun puzzle. Um, yeah. So I had to backtrack and figure out what was what there for a second. But I'm pretty, you know, I'm having a good time. Um, nice. The... Uh, the the um, oh boy, laser puzzle. I was going to ask my question. Moving away from uh, from this very good business discussion is um, mm. uh, ooh, oh 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 okay, I see. Um, uh, there's a. I think one of the things I like about this game is that the uh backstory and text has a very specific mythic quality. Like it's not just one. It, it doesn't feel like it's aping. It feels like it has a, 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 a touchstone reference, but it also feels it does a good job of making legend and fable feel natural to this world. Um, uh, I assume, uh, being from Sweden, that uh, given, like, I'm just reading the English in here, I assume you had some assistance um, from a uh, English-speaking uh, localizer of some kind. How did you sort of go about the process of, like, making sure this text and these interactions of characters in the world felt tonally consistent with what you wanted in your game yeah so um uh the first thing we did was of course like trying to build um like th the backstory for the game uh in itself yeah. uh that was uh most of that was written in swedish we didn't have any english-speaking people on the team back then yeah um like Nate, like who couldn't speak Swedish as well, um, so uh, so we didn't really have a, a need for for writing it in, in English until we actually started writing, you know, the the game assets, uh, the text assets for the game. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, at some point we we brought in like I I was writing actually the most of the the lore and backstory of the of the game and. Um, 
uh, we did take help from two different people um, with um, a little bit of story structure and a little bit of uh, fleshing out um, uh, with other stories and the narrative. And we also kind of asked the team for all these kind of ghost stories based on the lore and backstory we have come up with ideas for these kind of uh, scenes that we can put into the game um, to tell a story with it. But um, when we started writing the, the actual game, in-game assets, um, it was me who wrote all of them from the beginning, like trying to sort them up and, uh, and put them into in, it's a, into a neat Excel document, which is actually the tool of writing for, for many game developers. Oh, yeah. um, but I wrote them in, in English, I did. Uh, and then uh, we had, uh, had the, everything of it proofread by a native English uh, speaker by the very end of uh, uh, when, we, when we felt done with, uh, with the what the text assets had, but there were a lot of passes, like, you know, writing the text first time, um, it was way too much text. Uh, we, we didn't want the, the text boxes to be, you know, too too big or too many uh, in a row. Um, and that was obviously a, a big problem, like in the very beginning, because there are quite many complex situations we want to describe. Um, so it was uh, quite a long process of uh, boiling it down to the core to the essence of uh, what all the text assets should be. Uh, and while we, when we were done with that, we had some proofreading internally in the team. And then we sent it to, uh, to an English native speaker to proofread it. But it wasn't that many things that we needed to, to change. Some, some, of course, but uh, nice. um, kind of worked out very well. Yeah. I'm just going to give a shout out to AV Big Cat, who was also curious about the story uh, for this game. Yeah. So I think, you, I think you've, you've hit on something cool here with that uh, that's capturing their interest, at least. Um, my my follow up question, which was sort of I got it mixed up with the sort of practical, like how do you make all this text work in a game question. But I, I'm mm. curious what your what your personal philosophy was about like you mentioned asking your team, you know, for fables that they remembered and storytelling stuff. How did you yeah. how did you like how did you conceive of this kind of backstory for this world, and how did you try to make it feel mythic? Yeah. So. Uh, um... At, um, I, yeah, I mean, it's such a long process, so it's been uh, uh, way many uh, different uh, inspiration sources. Uh, and uh, I think, um, like, from the very beginning, we wanted to make something that was a bit like, you know, um, uh, after some kind of apocalypse and the people kind of are reset into another state of being. And uh, we, we felt like we needed this creation myth to kind of bend bend it all together, like get it all together in one one story and i was uh, reading um a lot by um a really old fantasy writer called uh, lord dunsany um who uh, was writing in the like end of the like 1800s uh and um he has a book called uh, the gods of pagana uh which was one uh, of the fir very first like uh intentionally fictional worlds written um, and described uh, in a book, like for recreation purposes, and um, that is really a very interesting kind of different kind of fantasy world uh, compared to uh, everything that come with Tolkien and after him. Uh, so I draw a lot of inspiration from that. But we also looked at like Native American legends and uh, at um, uh, Japanese mythology and try to try to build something that. Um, was something new and uh, and respectful for of those ideas that are are found in those different types of contexts. Um, yeah. Can you uh, can you say the name of that author again? Uh, uh, Lord Dunsany. Like Dunsany. Dunsany. All right. Yes. All right. I'll look that up for later. Uh, <laughs> we uh, we gotta we gotta get down to the to the end of our hour here in about ten minutes. And before we do that, I want to get in a question about. Yep the future of this game on other consoles because I've been fascinated to study how indies have been thriving on Switch. Yes. Um, I think in many, <laughs> for many, uh, I think uh, often because there's not a lot of games there. So yeah. um, I imagine you might, you might want to speak carefully about what your future plans for the project are based on your contract, but you know, just in general, like um, how do you feel about the Switch's marketplace as a place for indie developers to succeed and sort of um, how are you evaluating it in terms of your future as a company? Uh, I think Switch is uh, super interesting. Um, I I haven't bought a game console since the PS3, like way many years ago, and um, 
we bought in a few uh, Switch consoles to the company just to, you know, try them out uh, and uh, test out some games on them. Uh, and, in, and I ended up, like, uh, getting one myself because I liked it so much. It's, like, perfect for me. Nice. Um, so, but, I, like, I think it has a, some kind of appeal to be able to play, like, really high-quality games, um, uh, like, both on the TV and carrying it around. But I think more importantly, like uh, sitting in the sofa playing while someone else using the TV. <laughs> I think that's I that. probably I was a very that yeah. last night. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's a, for me, like a really good appeal. And I think uh, it has shown that a lot of other people also uh, see this appeal. And I also think uh, one very important thing is that this kind of um, opens up to. Uh, uh, an Asian market again as well, because especially in Japan, for example, it's been difficult to reach out with uh, with games. And um, as far as I know, we've got a lot of attention for Air in in Japan, for example. Um, so um, in that kind of sense, it kind of opens up uh, totally new markets, and uh, it uh, lets players uh, kind of enjoy these kind of experiences, not tied down to one location, but rather to to move around or play by flying or whatever um uh yeah i think it's a very interesting console and i um we are definitely gonna look at it like as we move forward with with the company in general yeah that's yeah. interesting i i hadn't considered um the 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 challenges that he's facing getting over to japan you know i know uh eight four which does um japanese game localization into north america has also done some good work in localizing uh, English language indie games, and sometimes publishing those games in Japan uh, on on PlayStation. So that's cool. Uh, I guess also, uh, you know, how do you feel about the idea of there being uh, a sort of a fresh market that's relatively uncluttered? Like that yeah. is what to me is so interesting about the Switch. Like, do you think that's appealing to you guys as a team? Yeah. And like, how long do you expect it might last? <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, it's uh, it's definitely very much less cluttered than all the other stores right now. Uh, but that's also, I think, mostly because it's so new. I mean, that's going to be the case for every new console, I think. I think that that is not the uh, the biggest drive for for the uh, for the Switch in itself. Maybe right now, but like. It, we we for for air for example we have uh, no current uh, work putting into porting the game for a switch um, it might be so that we put it in the plan uh, moving forward mm -hmm. but uh, right now we're concentrating on you know uh, fixing the problems that we've seen on the consoles we already released on and on PC of course uh, and that kind of stuff before we we do something like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, and when we are done with uh, with a port of Air, I'm not sure it's gonna be if if we develop develop it for the Switch. That is, um, I'm not sure it's gonna be as uncluttered. But yeah, uh, I think like if you look at um, uh, PlayStation Vita for some kind of uh, reference, um, because that's also I don't know the closest I can find in terms of game consoles to the Absolutely. Switch. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and I think that uh, there is quite. Uh, even the, though the console in itself didn't sell uh, too well, like globally over time, um, I think that the amount of games purchased per owner of a Vita is still quite high. Uh, so I think there is some kind of uh, um, some interest, some kind of interest in playing on that kind of device. It feels a bit different than you know buying something for um, for. Uh, uh, I don't know, for another console on TV. On, and on Steam, of course, people buy a lot of games, but usually to a very low price, and that's not really the case on consoles in general yet. So, right. Yeah. yeah, I think you're probably right. Um, yeah. Brian, we should probably close it out. Did I, do you have any last uh, uh, questions? Yeah, let's, um, let's kind of... Uh, oh, no, another sad fox. Dang it. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> Magic Slinky, I guess, brings us something that's worth uh, addressing and asking about. Is they say that they wish they could fly indoors. Obviously, it is far too late to yeah. patch that in. Um, yeah. But I, I am curious. You obviously knew you had a cool flying game on hand. Why did mm. you decide to ground the player when they went indoors to the temples? Uh, I think it was we wanted to have a change of pace to be able to focus on story aspects and to focus on a, another type of exploration in the game. Um, and uh, to be like completely honest, the flying mechanic needs a lot of space, and that's why the, the floating island kind of works for it. But 
if we have interiors where you could fly, they would be humongous and that would create other problems with consistency of how big an entrance is to how big the inside of the place is, which is already a problem. Uh, like if, if it goes too big, it will kind of ruin the, the, the idea of this is actually a place indoors. And there are some kind of those kind of limits that we, we felt were very difficult to tackle. But yeah, I mean, we would probably... Um, like if we if we did a game again, we would probably try to expand even more on the flying mechanic. Um, but it, I mean, it works fairly well as it does now, and you have a lot of things to fly through and find in the overworld as well. Cool. Um, I guess yeah. uh, speaking of flying mechanics, I guess I'll I, I I think you want every other developer to not do this, that your game can stand out <laughs> in the market. But if yeah. another developer wanted to make a flying game, what's the first piece of advice you would give them for flight? <laughs> Uh, um, I guess uh, like what we were after, uh, let's put it that way, was trying to make uh, flying feel smooth and intuitive, like trying to recreate the experience of how you imagine it is to be flying, yeah. rather than trying something physically based and uh, accurate, because I think those are two very different things, uh, and I think uh, experience-wise, uh, it works much better with... Uh, with the kind of flying mechanic we did. Like trying to figure out what kind of feel you want in your game mechanic. Cool. That would be the first. Then it's a good time, I think, to wrap things up. Um, yeah. thank, thank you all for watching today on the, uh, on the Gamma Sutra Twitch channel. Uh, Robin, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Yeah. Um, the game uh, is called Air, Memories of Old. that is now available on Steam, Xbox One, and PS4. Um, we've been playing the PS4 version today, in case you're curious. Um, it's very nice. Um, uh, we talked a lot about today. If you're just late on the uh, joining us later in the stream, we talked earlier about the game's design, some of the business stuff. We'll be putting all that on Gamasutra.com. Um, while you're here, if you aren't already following us, we would love it if you gave us a follow. Just scroll down and click the follow button, and when your notifications are on, you will get uh, you will get word when we are talking to other game developers. Um, you can also read more about the art and business of making games on Gamma Sutra. Um, Robin, if they have questions for you about life in indie dev, maybe if they want to move to Sweden. Um, oh my god, it's a bear. Um, uh, if they have those questions, where should they contact you? Uh, I am available on Twitter at uh, uh, Forgotten Key SE. I'm taking care of the Forgotten Key handle, so at Forgotten Key SE. Nice. Uh, and they can just write to me there. Cool. Awesome. Uh, with that, thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Awesome. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Cool bear.